Our next honoree, and uh, as uh, President Clinton, and especially as we, as we reflect on the, President Clinton's role in, uh, in the peace process, our next honoree, his parents are from Belfast, and as I think Peter, uh, President Clinton said it best, there is no better writer in America, or journalist or reporter than Pete Hamill. Um, and it's really hard to sum him up in a few words. Uh, aside from his career as a columnist, his best-selling memoir, A Drinking Life, and a slew of novels, and Forever, that's my favorite novel. I just love that book. It's a great poem about the history of New York. Um, he was the only person to have ever been editor-in-chief of the Daily News and the Post, right? <laughs> and uh, though he's had some health challenges in the past couple of years, he's a strong Belfast guy, and we're so thrilled to have him here today. And he's actually on the circuit again because he has a book on Frank Sinatra, uh, Peach used to hang with the Rat Pack, and uh, uh, so he's been speaking about uh, why Sinatra matters. And um, I won't go into the famous people that you dated, Pete, since your wonderful wife, <laughs> Pukiko, is here. Uh, but in Irish circles, Pete is known to all of us as a, an expert in Irish America, especially the Irish in New York. And... Um, He's been so good to the magazine over the years and uh, gave us a short story for our very second issue. It was at our launch of our magazine and it's been so supportive over the years. We're thrilled to have Pete Hamill with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Pete Hamill. He's going to speak from the table. I, um, a couple of years ago, I broke two of my hips, I don't know how, but it's a double pain in the, you know what. <laughs> Forgive me for s s remaining seated. Um, like all the others here in this room, not simply the people winning awards, but all of us, I could not be here without the help of others, especially Anne Devlin from Madrid Street in the Short Strand in Belfast, and Billy Hamill from Leeson Street in the Lower Falls, whose heart was broken by Belfast and forced them into exile um, into uh, the beautiful Democratic Republic of Brooklyn, um, <laughs> land of uh, many escapes, and the place that gave me my life. Um, both of them were fairly short uh, in spite of the rumors about Belfast water being especially strengthening. But they were giants. And I rode in on their shoulders um, and the shoulders of many other people who gave me my craft, my life, the books I read and the books I wrote. Um, it has been a wonderful journey. I have very few regrets, and I'm not going to sing my way. <laughs> if I had to si sing anything, it would be, you make me feel so young. <laughs> uh, As the first American in the family, there, were, there ended up seven children. It was a madhouse, uh, a wonderful, cheerful, forgiving madhouse in which we all took care of each other. And I, as the first American, had to explain the important parts of Brooklyn religion. For example, 
what a bunt was, what a, a ground ball was. My mother never got it. My father became an American by sitting and cheering for Jack Roosevelt Robinson number 42 and sitting in Nevitz Field, uh, the center of our religious uh, life. Um, and doing it until he couldn't do it anymore. Uh, in my case, most of my life has been an alloy, and I think that's typical of New Yorkers. So I'm Irish and proudly so, uh, but I'm part Italian too. <laughs> The Caputos lived across the hall of our Brooklyn tenement. And I think our American lives began when Mrs. Caputo, out of pity and compassion, taught my mother how to make the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted nothing else for the rest of our lives. I think four of the brothers who married Italian girls. It had to be the food. I was also part Jewish. As a young kid, 11, an altar boy at the Catholic Church, um, I was stopped by a rabbi one day at the synagogue near my house in Brooklyn. And he made me the Shabbos Goy. I was the guy who turned on the gas stove. I was the guy who picked up the newspaper out of the hallway and brought it into the house. I tried to, he tried to teach me Yiddish. Um, and I could not have gotten through a full life in a city that contains Donald Trump uh, without words like schmuck. <laughs> but there were other great gifts that I got from the Jews as the, and I, I did my little part trying to explain to him that the Cincinnati Reds were not socialists. You know, they were a baseball team. And, um, but I also got irony. I got a sense that it doesn't matter where you came from if you were in New York, the education was gonna be there for you. You know, and the example of going out for an education was there, even though I was a high school dropout at 16. Um, it was put into my head to stay and still there. I was Latino too. My closest friend for, 50, for 20 years was Jose Torres. Uh, and he and I would talk about my fellow Irishman in Spanish. <laughs> saying, mira, este pendejo es un... <laughs> uh, and uh, alas, uh, like all friendships that last forever, I ended up having to bury him because otherwise he would have to bury me. And I was also African American, I loved jazz music, I interviewed Dizzy Gillespie and Art Blakey. I became friends with Max Roach, the great, great drummer from Bedford-Stuyvesant and the United States. Uh, and all of them, in one way or another, fed my writing. Uh, I was, I would rejoice in certain ways about the beauty of Brooklyn, the color of the skies, 
the views from up on the, the hills in Prospect Park where I could see all the way to this desolate place called New Jersey. Uh, I loved the subways. I would take subways just for pleasure to see where they took me, to see na neighborhoods that were not my own. Uh, and to walk around and get a sense of how people lived. And I had my fellow religion, religious people, Robinson and Reese, Snyder and Ferrillo, and others whose names are part of my generation. But above all, I had the Brooklyn Public Library, not only the main office at Grand Army Plaza, but the local branch, a Carnegie Library built by my favorite and financed by my favorite millionaire, one of 1,600 libraries that he put into the world, helping people he never met. Um, and that place was a place of safety. The bad guys never went to the library. Uh, and surprise and cheerfulness and, and a sense of discovery. We were poor. My father with one leg lost his leg in, in, in playing soccer before penicillin, uh, but had a life and was a father and sat there and listened to us babble and encouraged us. And so, although we were poor, we were not for a day impoverished. We had the library. I sailed to Treasure Island, for Christ's sakes. You know, I went, hung out with the Count of Monte Cristo. What more could I want out of a life? And in there was born whatever kind of li li writer I am. Uh, the romance and surprise and vivaciousness of language, of poets, of people who do, did things with language that was more than my first books. My first book that I read all the way through was Bamba the Jungle Boy at the Giant Cataract. I thought it was about a guy who, whose mother had a bad eye, like my Aunt Rose who had a cataract. And then I, would strut around saying that I know another word for waterfall. Um, and what I learned was in the library and in the neighborhood where I grew up and from my family, um, something I wish I could tell to every kid in this country. Believe in possibility. Maybe tomorrow the world might not get better, but the day after tomorrow will be pretty good. Trust me, I've been there. Um, so I hope that those of us who have had fortunate lives, who have overcome uh, what should have been liabilities to become men and women in the world, living lives, to remember that there were kids out there that need someone to whisper some sense of hope. And we can do that. Um, people are doing it right now. There are people in this room who are helping kids overcome what looks like liability and who will have a place in this planet like every other kid should have. 
at the same time, uh, I hope that every one of us in this room and everyone who we know will remember when it was a, a terrible moment when we got knocked down because the rule in those neighborhoods was if you're knocked down, you got to get up. Sometimes people helped you to get up. And if we see people who have been knocked down, there's no shame in offering a hand to say, get up, we'll take a walk. So thank you all for this. Um, I am deeply honored. And do not forget where we all came from. <laughs>